for the Lord to come by and do something. Amen. 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 All right, take your Bibles this morning. Really, I don't really know where to send you as far as your Bible. Uh, as far as your Bibles, I'm going to be in a few different places. But let's start out in Acts chapter three. We'll start out in Acts chapter number three. And uh, I don't know exactly how this message is going to help you tomorrow at school or at work or at whatever you do during the day. And, but that's what you got to understand about the Bible. The Bible's not written for you to have a better Monday. The Bible's written to teach you about God. And I don't know about you, but personally, uh, anytime I learn something about the Lord, regardless of how it helps me in my practical life, I enjoy it. Amen? And so I want you to understand that your Bible's written. Uh, the most important event in your life was what? The day you got saved, right? I mean, that's the most important event in your life. There is, listen, I, uh, my wedding day was a huge event in my life. The day that my children were born was a huge event in my life. Um, there, there are, you know, several monumental events. Hopefully I'll have even some more monumental events. I'm hopefully going to get my master's degree in November. Hopefully going to get my doctorate degree next year. Hopefully I'm going to have some grandchildren one day. You know, hopefully I'll, hopefully I'll finally be able to get a hot tub, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, uh, so monumental, that'll probably be the greatest accomplishment of my life whenever I can finally get a hot tub. Justify paying for a hot tub. But uh, there's all these events in, in your life that is monumental. But the greatest is salvation. The day that you got translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. The day you went from being a son of the devil to a son of God. The day you got all your sins forgiven, never be remembered again. That's the greatest day in your life. But it's like Dr. Ruckman says, we have to now think what though is the greatest day in the life of Jesus Christ. What would be the greatest event in the life of Christ. And Dr. Rutman said this, and I agree with him 110%, that the greatest day in the life of Jesus Christ will be the day when he finally gets to come back and rightfully reclaim that which is his. It'll be the day when Jesus Christ returns on a white stallion and we're riding with him, amen. He's clothed in a white garment, dipped in blood, many crowns upon his head, a new name written on his thigh, which is the word of God, and he tramples out the wine press uh, and marches in through the eastern gate of Jerusalem, down through the touches down on the Mount of Olives, marches down through the Kidron Valley, up into the eastern gate and rightfully reclaims the throne of his father David, having put all enemies and all dominions and powers under his feet uh, and becomes the king of the universe. The second coming of Christ is the, what probably, in my opinion, one of the most least talked about subjects in our churches and in our Bible colleges. You can ask a, 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 any fundamental Baptist Bible college graduate about the second advent and their knowledge is going to be minimal at best. I know that there used to be many great men that used to preach on these. I think of Harold Seitler and Ralph Sexton Sr., probably one of the two greatest preachers in our recent years that preached on the second coming of Christ. In fact, Harold Seitler did an entire series on the second coming of Christ. You don't hear that kind of stuff much anymore. Notice now, the Bible oftentimes in the Bible records... Uh, uh, the time, or the, excuse me, the day of the Lord as referred to as the times, or the times, uh, plural. We find that the day of the Lord is referred to many, uh, many times as the time of this or the time of that. And so we're going to look this morning at three places where the Bible talks about the second advent and it uses the word time. Notice, first of all, if you're there in Acts chapter number 3, look at chapter 3 and verse number 19. Peter is preaching, and Peter's preaching to a bunch of who? Jews, right? you got to understand, Peter's preaching to Jews. And notice what Peter says to this group of Jews in Acts 3.19. Repent you therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Notice now, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of of the Lord. I want you to notice, first of all, about the second advent, about when Jesus Christ comes and reclaims that which is rightfully His. The first thing it will be, it will be a time 
of refreshing. There are two main things that will happen on the day of the Lord that will refresh the earth. First of all, notice certain parts of the curse are lifted off of the earth during this time. During the millennial kingdom when Jesus Christ comes back and establishes His dominion and establishes His kingdom, there are going to be certain parts of the curse that are completely lifted off of the earth. Notice in verse 20, why does it say there's going to be times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord? Because of verse 20, And he shall see unto Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution. We'll get into that in just a moment. But notice the reason why there's going to be a time of refreshing on the earth is because Jesus Christ will once again be here. Amen. Listen, you've heard it said a million times. There can be no peace until the Prince of Peace is here. Amen. All these leaders trying to bring in world peace and world unity and trying to bring in and, you know, usher in the age of enlightenment and all this stuff. It absolutely cannot happen until Jesus Christ is physically here ruling with a rod of iron over the nations. Notice the refreshing of the earth uh, finds many different things. Notice, first of all, that sickness is completely removed. We will not take time to go to all these references, but Isaiah 33, 24 and Jeremiah 30, 17 says that sickness will be removed. Imagine a time, talk about refreshing. Imagine a time when there's no more sickness and no more disease. There's no more children that can't walk. There's no more people dying of cancer. There's no more people that, you know, have all these illnesses and sicknesses. No more coronavirus. Coronavirus. Somebody say amen right there. Uh, there's no more of all these sicknesses that plague us. Uh, it'll be a time where sickness is removed. Not only that, but it'll be a time when deformities shall be healed. Isaiah 29, 18 and Isaiah 35 verses 5 and 6 say that deformities will be completely removed. No more deformities. No more people, uh, no more babies being born with cleft palates and no more children uh, being born with uh, certain diseases that make them crippled and paraplegics and all this kind of... There is no more of that, amen? Talk about a time of refreshing. How about this one? The Bible says in Isaiah 35, 1 and 2 that the land will be healed, amen? No more droughts and no more plights and no more crops failing, no more having to dig and all this guy. The Bible says the land will be healed. But not only that, it will be refreshing because not only will the earth or certain parts of the curses be lifted, but Satan will be bound in the bottomless pit. Amen? Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 through 3 says the God of this world will no longer be in control. The earth will be free from the influence of Satan. A time when life expectancy is like that before the flood with babies, according to Isaiah 65, 20, babies dying at 100 years old. Can you imagine that? Babies dying. Man, he was, he was so young. He was only a hundred years old when he died. Imagine that. Imagine a time when Satan will be completely gone. A time where he will be bound for a thousand years. No devilish influence. Uh, no Satan to rule. Listen, I cannot wait until the time when we can rule and reign with Christ and we no longer have to worry about the devil. Amen? Um, listen, the devil hates you. The devil hates your family. The devil hates everything you are about. He hates your God. He hates your Bible. He hates everything that you're trying to do. If you're lost, he wants you to die and go to hell. If you are saved, he wants to make your life of no influence and make you miserable till you get to heaven. Understand the devil is your enemy, but thank God there is coming a day when we will no longer have to worry about the devil or worry about his influence. I like what the song says, oh, when we see Christ, uh, the tempter will be banished and will lay our burdens down. Amen. Satan will be bound for a thousand years. A refreshing change will take place. The second advent will be the ultimate quote-unquote refresher. You ever heard people say, well, let's take a short break for refreshment or we've got some refreshments after the service or something like that. Notice the second advent when Jesus Christ is finally ruling and reign, reigning as the king. That'll be the ultimate refresher. With natural disaster, innocent blood being shed, filthiness filling the world. Romans 8 even says that the creation, the world, the natural environment itself is waiting 
for the adoption and the redemption of itself with the absence of Satan and with the curses lifted, this will truly be the time of refreshing. But not only that, notice it's not only the time of refreshing, but it is also, as we see in verse number 21, it is the time of restitution. Now, that word restitution has the idea of a payback. Uh, you hear it talked about uh, today with, uh, with, with African-Americans, with black people, that they're going to get paid. They want reparations. Y'all ever heard that word, reparations? Uh, city of Asheville got in national news a couple of months ago because they said, we're going to vote in reparations. And they passed reparations. Now, reparations are supposed to be when uh, you are enslaved and you're wrongly enslaved, uh, that the uh, government or whoever it is pays you for stuff that happened in the past, all right? The only time that the American government has ever actually paid reparations, to my knowledge, is when we put Japanese people in internment camps here in America during World War II. We took Japanese people and we put them in internment camps during World War II because they were, you know, the Japanese, we were fighting the Japanese. And uh, when they got out, we paid them reparations. Those were actually people who were actually put in camps that we paid afterwards. Nobody living today, no black person has ever been enslaved in America living today. Nobody, no white man living in America today has ever been a slave owner. So this whole talk of reparations is absolutely dumb and foolish. Amen. They're talking about now, well, well, slavery can even be felt in the DNA. There's something even genetic how people can still feel slavery. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Somebody say amen right there. Now notice this. Uh, reparations. The city of Asheville said they were going to pay reparations to all the, you know, the black community. And what they did, they never, listen, not a single black person ever saw a dime of those reparations. What they did is they simply took money from the police and they simply redirected it to start new black initiatives and to increase the, you know, the community of black people and to do different projects that are supposed to aid black people. Not a single black person saw a dime of that money. It all just went into community projects and all that kind of stuff. So notice, all this talk about reparations and all this, it's absolutely just a bunch of political nonsense fueled by the left. Somebody say amen right there. But there is coming a time, we find in Acts 3.21, a time of restitution. A time of quote-unquote payback that Jesus Christ will have. Notice the first time Jesus Christ came, he came like a lamb. But the second time he's coming, he's coming like a lion, amen? The first time he came in peace. The second time he comes in war, amen? Now notice Jesus Christ said in Luke 10, 34, He says, I come not to send peace on the earth. Amen. He says, I come not to send peace, but a sword. Jesus Christ is always divided. And when Jesus Christ comes back, He will divide. Amen. He will separate the sheep from the goats. Uh, when Jesus Christ comes back, He's not coming as a babe in a manger, but He's coming as a warrior on a horse. When He, comes, when he came the first time, He came as a suffering Savior, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But when He comes back the second time, He will come back as a conquering King uh, here to reclaim what is His. Notice the word restitution in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary says the act of returning or restoring to a person something or right of which he has been unjustly deprived. Boy, that's a mouthful when you consider the second advent. Jesus Christ for some 2,000 years has been unjustly deprived of what he's coming back. You ever seen that bumper sticker? They sell it down at the bookstore. They sell that bumper sticker that says Jesus is coming and boy is he angry. Amen. The Bible says in Revelation 19, listen, the first time he came, John 3, 18, I come, he said, or excuse me, John 3, 17, he says, I come not to, con I came not in the world to condemn the world, but that through me the world might be saved, right? He says, I'm not coming to condemn you. I'm not coming. Listen, he says, condemnation belongs to somebody else now, not me right now. But listen, when Jesus Christ comes back in the second advent, Revelation 19, the Bible says, and He doth judge and make what? War. Amen. When He comes back, He's coming in vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will what? Repay. 
Oh, right now we're living in the age of grace. Right now we're living in a time where God seeks the salvation of all men. Now, we're, we're Bible believers, right? We don't believe that God loves everybody. The Bible clearly says that God hates the workers of iniquity. It says that He's angry with the wicked every day. We do not believe as Bible believers that God loves everybody. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ is the only way that you can get the love of Christ. The only way that God shows His love to a sinner is through the sacrifice of His Son. We can read that clearly in John 16 and John 13. But we're not Calvinists, right? We believe that God desires the salvation of every man, woman, and boy, and girl living on planet earth. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, right? But there is coming a day when God is going to judge and make war. He is going to get the ultimate last laugh. In fact, the only time we ever find God laughing... Now, this is some sick stuff if you really think about it. You know the only time we ever find God laughing in the Scriptures is when He's throwing people into hell? When the only time that we ever find God laughing is when He is judging those that have rejected Him. Notice now, the Bible says that Israel be restituted of their land. Ezekiel 37 and Joel chapter 3, all the parting and dividing will be over. The Jew will get every square inch of land that is promised to them. You know the Bible says that one of the greatest judgments that falls on the nations during the millennial kingdom will be for the sin of dividing and trying to separate God's land in Israel. In fact, you get Brother Grady's book, How Satan Turned Americans God. The very first chapter is dedicated to showing that every time America gets involved with trying to divide up the Jews' land, a natural disaster hits the country. Every single time. You're supposed, Joel chapter 3 says that when God judges the nations, one of the things that He will judge them based upon is how they viewed the land grant of Israel. Listen, you know how many wars have been started for that little piece of dirt over there in the Middle East? And one day God's going to restitute all that. The Bible also says that Jesus will be restituted of His kingdom. Revelation eleven fifteen. we studied that in Sunday school this morning. Right now, Satan is the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. That is why he has the power in Matthew chapter 4. To, he knows what he says to Jesus. He says, if you'll bow down to me, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world. Well, how could Satan offer the kingdoms of this world to Jesus if he didn't own them? So right now, Satan is the God of this world. He owns the kingdom. But the Bible says, like I've already quoted, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. I will repay. That will become a reality. It'll be a time of restitution. Now listen, we're Bible believers, right? We believe parts of the Bible we like and we believe parts of the Bible we don't like. You know the Bible says over there in Isaiah chapter 60, or excuse me, Psalms chapter 68, I believe it is. It might be Psalms 58, but I think it's Psalms 68, where it talks about that we will bathe our feet in the blood of our enemies. You say, that's sick, preacher. Oh, no, 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 it's not sick. When, listen, you've got to understand something. If you had the same view of sin and wickedness that God has... Listen, when Jesus Christ comes back, some of these fundamentalists, man, I, I, maybe they just don't even try to think about it. Maybe some of these guys, they don't even try to think about it. Listen, they, they act like God's up there in heaven just crying and bawling and going, please get saved, please get saved. Please. Listen, God seeks the salvation of all men. But at the same time, those are the enemies of God. In fact, the Bible calls the rejecting Jews right now the enemies of the gospel. Paul talks about the enemies of the cross in Galatians chapter number 6. All these reprobates and God deniers. and Listen, there are people right now in the city of Asheville, they hate your God, they hate your Bible, they hate this church, they hate everything about you, they blaspheme the name of God, they don't want to have anything to do with Christianity. You can say Muhammad around them, you can say Buddha around them, you can say Confucius around them, and they don't bleak an eye, but you start talking about Jesus Christ and Him being the only way to heaven, you start talking about heaven and hell, 
hell. Man, they go absolutely berserk. And you think that we should just be, oh, well, uh, they're just the kindest, sweetest people. And we ought to just love them. Uh, listen, man, I, David said, I hate them with a what? Perfect hatred. Now, that doesn't mean we go and burn down their houses and throw rocks at them. The Bible says that all men shall know us because we love one another. The Bible puts emphasis on loving the brethren, not on loving the sinner. Now, I believe in being kind to people. And what does the Bible say to do? The Bible says if you see your enemy hunger, do what? Give them food. If you see them thirst, give them water. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on their head. That means that if you're showing kindness to these lost people and you're showing them you're showing them mercy and grace and you're trying to lead them to the Lord and you're giving them food when they're hungry and giving them water when they're thirsty, the Bible says that if they don't accept Christ, that's only going to add to their condemnation in hell. You can cross-reference Romans 12 back to Psalms. So I'm not talking about throwing rocks and screaming at them. I don't listen when we go street preaching. I don't believe in looking at people and say, "You're going to fry in hell, buddy." You know, you trust the bread of life, or you'll be French toast. And I don't believe in all that stuff. Amen. But at the same time, these are the enemies of God, and one day He is going to literally come back and trample. He's going to tromp out the wine press. He is going to squash them like grapes where the blood is going to run all the way up to the horse's bridle. And we're going to come back with them in Joel chapter 2 as the army following Him out of heaven, Revelation 19. And we're going to bathe our feet in the blood of the enemies of God. It's a time of restitution. Oh, but no, let's let's end on on a good note, amen. See, that's proper business practice. If you've got to deal with something... Start out with positive, then do the negative, then end with positive. It's positive, negative, positive. Amen? Notice, let's end on something positive. You ready? Not only will it be a time of refreshing, not only will it be a time of restitution, but last of all, it'll be a time of reigning and reward. Look there at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 12. See, this kind of preaching wouldn't fly in most churches. Let's just be honest. This all talk about the second advent. First of all, most people don't even know what the second advent. They don't know the difference between the day of the Lord and the rapture. They don't know the difference between the millennial kingdom and eternity. And so this kind of preaching, not only would it go over most people's heads, but at the same time, they don't want to hear all this talk. They'd rather find out how to have, you know, they'd rather have a 10-week study on how to, have a, how to have a stronger marriage or, you know, 10-week study. There are some churches that spend an entire month, a, they call it stewardship month, an entire month where all 12 sermons are about money. And yet they completely overlook. Listen, you know there are over 500 verses in your King James Bible that deal with the second advent of Christ. It is absolutely, teetotally, the most talked about event in all the Bible. And it is absolutely missing in the preaching of our churches today. Notice the second advent. It'll be a time of reigning and reward. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 12. The Bible says here, If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. Amen? If we live for the Lord as saved individuals, the Bible talks about us ruling and reigning with Christ a thousand years as kings and priests upon the earth. That's Revelation 1, 6 and Revelation 20, verse 6. We receive our rewards at the second coming, which will include the crowns and the millennial inheritance. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 says, For you know what inheritance you have, for you serve the Lord Christ. Now there is an inheritance, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, there is an inheritance in heaven, incorruptible, which fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, right? There are some things you get just because you're the child of God. There are certain benefits that my children receive just because they're my children. But... If they want to get some rewards, they've got to do something a little bit special, right? That's the same with me and you. There are certain things you're going to get just because you're a child of God. But if you want those rewards and if you want to reign, listen, no cross, no crown. No suffering, no reigning. No serving, no ruling. It'll be a time of rewards and reigning. Understand this, that right now it may look bleak, 
It may look dark. It may seem like the rulers of this world and the rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places is gaining the advantage, and I've got some bad news for you. It doesn't just look that way. It's a reality. They are. There is no national revival coming. There is no great moving of God coming. There is no great sweeping, you know, the, the moral majority started by Falwell and all those guys in the 80s where, boy, if we could just vote in Christians and if we can just vote in righteous people, then we'll usher in this coming age of righteousness in our government and everything will just be hunky-dory. I like President Trump just fine. I mean, I voted for him. I'll vote for him again if he's to run. But notice even Brother Trump, during his, during his uh, uh, primary, or during, while he was running for, uh, while, during his candidacy, what did he do? Held up a rainbow flag that said gays for Trump on it. Yeah. Held it up and was... Righteousness exalted the nation, right? Yeah. The reality is it's not going to get any better. But my, 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 don't we have a hope that one day God's going to even out the score. There's going to be a time of refreshing. There's going to be a time of restitution. And there's going to be a time of reward. We've just got to stay faithful. Listen, in these last days, it is all about survival. It is all about hold. Listen, what, is, what does John say to the churches? Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. And that's where we are in these last days. And I still think we can see some victors. I still think we can see this church full. I still think we can see some people saved and baptized and all that good stuff. But in these last days, it is paramount for us to keep the faith, hold the fort. For the Lord is coming, but we've got to remain faithful till the end. Because it's all... Listen, somebody said, are you pre-trib or post-trib or mid-trib? And I, and I understand. Listen, I'm pre-trib to the core, right? I'm 100% pre-trib to the core. But I'm also, I also... One guy said, well, I don't know, preacher. I think I'm just paying. What do you mean paying? Are you pre, mid, or post? No, I'm paying. So what do you mean paying? So I think it's all going to pan out. Amen? And what you got to realize is one day it's all just going to pan out. Amen? God's going to even up the score and all these things and all these things we don't understand and all the... Well, why is God letting the wicked go so long? That's all right. One day everybody, everybody's going to give. Well, what does Romans 14 say? So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Amen? One day it's all going to even out and you're going to see what happens and you're going to be glad on that day that you've been faithful to God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for letting us be in church. Lord, we've already had a wonderful song service. Lord, thank you, Lord, for your word and the preaching. I pray you bless our time here together now. Bring us back safely at 2 o'clock. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Alright, I love you. You are dismissed.